Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining from today. My name is Gaia Manoukian. I'm the editor for the English Gateway. And today, I'm happy to welcome you to this exciting and insightful, insightful webinar uh, discussing practical approaches and tools that FSPs can use to address the proximity gap. Before we get started, I'd like to go over just a quick logistics. Um, please know that your microphones will remain muted throughout the session as we try to maintain a good sound quality for the webinar. This does not mean, however, that we don't want you to get uh, engaged in the discussion. Please do so by submitting your questions in the right hand uh, of your screen uh, through the chat box. And when you do so, make sure you select all participants so that our moderator is able to see it. And then we will address them during the Q&A session at the end. And one last thing, um, please note that this session is being recorded and we will share the recording with you within the next two days. Thank you, and with that, here is John Balaba. Thank you, Gaia. Good morning, everyone um, who was in this webinar. Um, the webinar is about the, um, I mean, practical tools on how to manage the challenge of proximity. As we all know, you know, many institutions, many FSPs are, you know, grappling with how to manage on the issue of proximity. Proximity here meaning how do we, you know, take the services that we, we, we offer to the people who need them. Now, um, we have a number of speakers who are going to take us through uh, um, this webinar. We have Binya Mutiso, who works with Oxford Policy Management. Uh, we have Marvin Chibuye, who works with uh, Vision Fund Zambia. And we have Kaspar Feedback, who works with uh, NARAS um, on the technical side of the tools that you, we are using to address the issue, the, the challenge of proximity. And then we have Abed uh, Dako, who is um, uh, a CEO of uh, DSS Technologies, best in Ghana. Um, to start with, um, again, my name is John Balava. I work with um, Oxford Policy Management in the Department of Financial I mean, Inclusion. I am working as a, a fund manager for the savings at the Frontier Project, which is um, a partnership, I mean, between um, Oxford Policy Management and, um, and MasterCard Foundation. The, 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 this is a six and a half year program, you know, that seeks to uh, bridge the gap between the supply of formal financial services and the informal savings mechanism. And our mission of this project, which is the Savings at the Frontier, I will um, abbreviate it as SCTF, uh, our mission is to scale up financial services to at least, for at least 25,000 rural and semi-urban households in sub-Saharan Africa via innovative FSP-led business models. We are currently working, implementing this project of Savings at the Frontier in three uh, sub -Sah I mean, sub-Saharan African countries, which is uh, Tanzania, Ghana, and Zambia. And in these countries, we are working with um, um, uh, a number of FSPs, um, eight of them in number. These include banks, microfinance institutions, and fintechs. Now, I've talked about informal saving mechanism in my introduction. What are they? The, the informal saving mechanisms is, 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 is what we came up with as a terminology to include all the saving ways that people come up with to save uh, money. And um, we refer this to, um, to mean the ways in which groups of people save money together. And in doing so, the ISMs are helping, you know, approximate access by combining savings when people um, I mean, come together. So it is more effective for ISMs to have smaller savings deposited at the nearest agent or bank by one person rather than having several, you know, individuals 
doing it. So, what is the proximity gap, which is the key uh, discussion of this, um, I mean, of this webinar? Now, for a long time, uh, um, proximity has been identified as an obstacle for most of the financial institutions to, um, uh, I mean, to have sustainable take up and use of formal financial services by low income and rural customers. So proximity to financial service provider is a determining factor to have sustainable you know, uptake and usage of financial products they offer to the market. Now proximity gap, this is the distance that people need to travel in order to save money securely and later access it in order to be able to spend it or to transfer it to other people I mean elsewhere. Now the 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 uh, many FSPs, you know, the shortage of useful and the practical information about the scale and the nature of proximity gap in specific locations and in different countries. And because of this, it has been very hard for many FSPs to come up with ways on how to tackle um, this challenge. Also. The, the, the FSPs, in most cases, get discouraged to offer, you know, uh, financial services in, you know, rural areas because they don't know, they don't have any practical information of um, um, what it is to do with the proximity gap. What is the distance? What is it that needs to be done? So because of lack of this information, it becomes so hard for the FSPs to easily you know, extend their services to a certain group of people, a certain class of customers in a given location, more especially in the rural areas. You find that most of the services that FSPs are offering are within, you know, the town centers where, you know, it is easier for them to reach the customers um, they want to serve. So, Still, you know, uh, uh, the linkage efforts that FSPs, you know, uh, I mean, are coming up with are much more, you know, uh, um, uh, um, affected. And these FSPs also, you know, get discouraged to offer or extend, you know, services in the less densely populated areas. And this is as a result of the lack of information about the distribution and the characteristics of the potential rural customers. Now, FSPs don't seem to, uh, uh, um, uh, to go beyond the comfort zones, but throughout what we are trying to address in this webinar, we are going to see what are the practical ways, how can we address the issue of proximity and for the FSP to be able to know exactly what is it, what is the population in this area and how can I serve them um, um, better. Um, at this point, I would uh, encourage all the participants to um, uh, to take a few minutes and um, answer the questions. You'll see the questions on your right hand side of your screen. You'll see the questions. Please answer them and um, do the submission. We would want to get the answers before the uh, the end of the seminar. So, I mean, of the webinar, we will keep this open. You know, you can fill it as we continue uh, the discussion. Please do not forget to click on the sub on, on the submit button that appears on the on the far right bottom of your screen, so that we can be able to receive um, um, your answers to the questions. Okay, so um, I'll now move on to the next, um, I mean to the first panelist, um, who is Mbinya Mutiso. I didn't give a detailed introduction of the panelists and I will ask each panelist to give a, um, um, a more, you know, not so much detailed introduction of themselves. Mbinya, you're welcome.
Minya, kindly unmute yourself. Uh, we cannot hear you at the moment. Hello, Binya. Thank you. That is done. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Binya Matisa. I'm working for the Oxford Policy Management in the setting of the Frontier Program. I'm an independent consultant based in Nairobi, Kenya. So we have been working uh, very closely with uh, all the panelists in the three partner countries, uh, especially trying to identify ways, map out ways how we can address the proximity challenge that George John has talked about. So now our work is basically looking at how we can turn these very critical issues into an addressable challenge. Why? Because we have seen in the past financial service providers who will go out, will or have linkage efforts with the rural communities in the form of uh, savings groups, solidarity groups, individual customers. And there could be quite a bit of take up of accounts, but usage uh, quite quickly drops off after the sign up. And the question has been in the minds of uh, ourselves and our, I'm sure many of you is why is there uh, lack of sustained uptake and use. And when looking at this and the partners that we are working with, the proximity or challenge became very apparent that is a driving factor to uptake and usage of this account. So we set out to actually look at what is the magnitude of the challenge, what is it, how is it affecting our customers and potential customers, and how can we realistically address it are using um, minimal resources, minimal time or money, minimal skills um, in a geolocation, and, and so on. And uh, so therefore, SEDIF uh, commissioned a scoping study, uh, commissioned a scoping study aimed at addressing the proximity challenge. Uh, sorry for that, I have gone to the wrong side. Addressing the proximity challenge. And this uh, scoping study we called moving proximity from a critical to an addressable challenge, possible approaches and tools. And uh, we have a publication that uh, will be available. Uh, we will give a link to that at the end of the webinar. The findings of our work have been of great interest to uh, partner SSPs. And we anticipate that this will also be of interest to other SSPs and to yourselves who are grappling with the same issues of how to actually realistically and uh, practically reach the customers we are trying to serve. If we look at the uh, uh, research already conducted in these areas, because what we're doing is not new, what we're looking at is how to actually address the challenge. In 2015-2017, there were studies conducted by the financial sector deepening in Zambia. And one like in that study, they showed that the expansion of mobile money brought 40% of adults within five kilometers of formal access funds. What are we saying there? What does that tell us? 60% is still quite excluded. It is still not within the formal access. And these have remained in top uh, close proximity to the urban share of the population, suggesting little or little meaningful expansion into rural areas. And this gives us, uh, brings us to our definition where we're calling the proximity cliff edge. Saying what? You will have uh, financial service providers, be it banks, MFIs, mobile network operators, going out to serve, to serve the, the rural poor and so on, but they only get so far. And it is easy to overestimate how far this has solved the, the proximity challenge. At this particular proximity cliffage, you find that any, any person, any SP uh, working deeper into the rural finds it very difficult to establish a viable aging business model because they simply do not have the numbers to support the business for, for the agent. We will see this quite clearly in uh, the Zambia case when uh, Marvin presents it. So we're looking and saying a good understanding of the proximity gap is key to building viable business models. So why is this important for us? And 
when we look at, when we do the, the, the scoping study, the results we get, what are we going to use this for? And we're saying that the SSPs will be able to use their valuable population data, that is, and here we use the census data, I'll get to that in a moment, to study the viability of increasing footprints into rural and peri-urban areas. They will be able to map and document the, where the informal uh, savings are, the informal savers are, where the competitors are, where mobile networks are, and of course, where the facilitating NGOs are for those who are working with uh, NGOs. And therefore, we will be able to tailor our delivery channels to reach there and serve, and also establish a database of the ISM customers. We're looking at location, numbers, and what kind of economic activities they are engaging in. Um, for this particular study, we use locally available, available tools, uh, which are easily downloadable from a Google or App Store. And we use a what three words, and we also use class codes finder. We use this to geolocate where the savings groups are, where banks are, where mobile network corporations are sitting, where bank agents are. These are simple to use and they work in both online and offline mode. But, but for example, we know that um, we know that um, internet connectivity in rural Africa can be very, very tricky. So these are the, 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 the tools that we use. And in our invite, I don't know how many of us were able to uh, download these tools. We asked you to download uh, what we was in class code finder. And if you did that, I would like you, if you have your phone on hand, you can look at your location, type what we are, what we was, get your location. The three words you will see at the top of the screen, the uh, map, locate the, the, situ the location where you are right now. And it has accuracy to three by three meters, which is much higher than other navigation apps like we have uh, Google Maps and so on. The beauty about these apps is that you can also, you can use them to describe your location, you can use them to save to phone, and you can also share it to somebody, with somebody, for example, in your agency. What we find this very important too, is that um, historically, we work with uh, savings groups in the rural area, and you find that you can deploy one, one field officer or field agent who is the one who interacts with these groups on a day-to-day -day basis, and they are the ones who know where these groups are. If this staff member leaves, then you're left with a gap of a knowledge of where the, the customer is. And even in a, a traditionally, how do we capture location? Is we capture it by landmark or a, a well-known name, but not the exact location or where this group meets or where the transact or where the NGO is, the facilitating NGO is. So you find that the capture of this data will also be very important for the financial service provider that can have a business continuity mechanism going on. So Marvin next is going to take us through how they actually use these tools in Zambia, and what the findings were, and what they are doing with those findings. Thank you. Marvin? Thank you, Mbinya. Greetings to everyone on the webinar. Uh, yes, my name is Marvin Chibuye, Project Manager for Vision Fund, with a focus on working with uh, savings groups. So my focus really has been on digitizing the savings groups. And with what Mbinya has talked about, uh, I would like to actually go through how we used uh, what three ways and plus code. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the aim of SACIF or Savings at the Frontier is really to bring the power of formal finance to people who display potentially attractive financial behaviors through the use of cash-based informal savings mechanism. So in Zambia, uh, both ends of this challenge are reasonably well set. There are a number of banks and mobile money operators competing for this business. And there are, there are many unsaved ISMs due to the sparseness of the population uh, in, the, in a very large uh, space. Zambia is a big country, so to speak. So mobile money 
has given rural Zambians a base of, of, of access to some financial uh, services, but not to the extent that is desired. You will find that those that are vibrant, indigenous ISMs, uh, there is some increasingly augmented kind of growth, and this is really with those that are facilitated by NGOs and some loan groups, including uh, what World Vision is calling Savings for Transformation, which is really something similar to what you would see in VS, VS, SLAs or silks and so on and forth, uh, so forth. So Zambians really mix uh, the use of cash-based informal transactions with new forms of uh, uh, largely digital form of finance. And uh, by this, I mean mobile money. So what, were we, well, what, what was the objective? So we're asking ourselves three questions. And these are, firstly, where are the village savings groups? Are they reached by formal finance? And secondly, does the mobile money network, which has grown rapidly, really depend enough for these village savings groups to use, to use the network for cash-ins and cash-outs? And thirdly, are there financial access models that can allow the form formalization of these urban chilimbas, we call them chilimbas in Zambia mostly, savings activities to be linked to formal uh, solidarity group lending, which you find, which you find uh, in most financial institutions like microfinance. So the start point really for us is what you are seeing on the screen, where we did using the same tools that you saw. Uh, that we spoke about rather, uh, the what three words and the plus code. We were able actually to get locations into some form of public domain mapping. And when you look at what we have on the screen, the brown ones represent the mobile network operators. The purple ones are solidarity groups. And the maroon ones and the yellow ones are really trading areas. So what we are doing is we go around Chongwe and we, we, we map out all these and put them into some form of map that you are seeing here. So when you speak about Chongwe, it's really a very huge area which covers about 5,150 square kilometers with a population of about 141,000 persons with an estimated number of 130 ISM groups, but these are really world vision groups and not other uh, partners. So we can say that they are much more than uh, we are actually looking at. So when we go to what I talked about in terms of the area, this is what you see about Chongwe in terms of boundaries. And we, 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 we got this from the public domain just to give you a picture of the expanse of the area we are talking about. Moving on. Overlay boundaries from administrative units in terms of our mapping onto the geo mapping of agents and groups. Like I said, uh, we, we map this. This is the Chongo area in terms of the boundary, but we actually spread it uh, just beyond Chongwe coming to areas that are very urban to Lusaka because Chongwe is really close to the capital city, which is uh, Lusaka. So these are the mappings that we're able to do. And potentially we're able to see where we can go. We're able to see where the MNO mobile money agents are sitting. We're able to see the trading areas uh, just through what the tools was able to provide, capturing the coordinates, putting them in the tools. So now, when we actually think through what has happened, are we able to say MNO and bank mobile agents are clustered in large, area, uh, large trading areas and smaller trading areas along the major highways? The answer is yes. That's what we're able to see as we actually did the mapping. So the groups are meeting large social spaces within three kilometers from where they live and work. But members are willing to walk. That's what we have seen from the field. 
sometimes up to three kilometers or cycling up to five kilometers to deposit and withdraw a week's worth of spending. That could be around $35. Uh, However, the majority of groups may even travel up to 60 kilometers to access a mobile network operator or bank mobile money agent, incurring a cost of approximately uh, $6, or in the local currency, that would be six kwacha. So how are we using this information? Well, we have now documented uh, this information on data where the uh, ISMs are located for ease of reach by any member of staff of Vision Fund to an accuracy of three by three meters. We have revised our KYC info to include a capture of ISM locations as opposed to using free form field data as we did before. Okay. So we know where our solidarity groups are. We know where the mobile money agents are. Like I said, we've been able to actually go beyond Chongwa just to look at the peri-urban areas. Apart from the deep rural ones, we're able to see uh, the locations of, of potential agents and the locations of savings groups. Which, based on this data, we can segment our customers by region or economic activity, depending on our engagement through product refinement. From the data, we can also see spaces where there are no mobile money or bank agents, where our customers can actually transact. We therefore can partner with any mobile money network operator to deploy agents where there are adequate numbers of customers to support, of course, through a viable agent outlet. Lastly, I want to say that we are also exploring a module where individual members of savings groups can be recruited as mobile money agents to serve the communities where they live. So I'll leave it now to Casper to continue with Webby. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Um, so my name is Casper. I'm an industrial researcher at NIRIS, which is an engineering consultancy based in Copenhagen. And I'm also attached to Ogo University uh, in Copenhagen as well. Now I've been attached to the uh, Savings of the Tier project uh, in a pilot study in trying to handle the proximity issue and trying to answer the questions, can we differentiate between, can we create a scalable version where we can differentiate between urban areas and rural areas, uh, underserved areas and well-served areas, and also differentiate between different types of urban structures, so um, informal settlements and suburbs um, and so on. This is, um, this fits into my, uh, my research area, which is birth observation and data fusion. So just, I think I'll do a brief introduction about what um, birth observation is. So earth observation is um, gathering knowledge about the earth by observing it from afar. So this would uh, traditionally probably be from satellites, which is the data that we've used for this pilot project. So um, what you see here is a radar image of the uh, greater Accra region in Ghana. Um, we've used multiple types of satellite data sources, but the two primary ones are radar data and optical data. So um, the radar data, which you can see here, is from an active satellite called the Sentinel-1 satellite, which is part of the Copernicus program of the European Space Agency. But what it does is that it actively sends a signal to the Earth. Then you measure uh, on the bounce um, signal. And this tells us something about the texture of the surface is, um, and the permanence of the surface as well. Does this change over time? Is it very coarse? Is it very smooth? Um, if the signal is very strong, you probably have a, a wall or a structure or something turned towards the satellite. And if it is permanent over time, you can uh, try to derive um, 
information about whether or not it's a man-made structure or not. We've also used optical images, um, which is like fancy cameras um, going around the globe, looking in uh, many, uh, many different spectral signatures or bands. Um, so you're not just looking at red, green, blue, you're also looking at infrared and so on. And we can use this uh, to tell us about what type of urban areas are we then looking at. So the radar images are really good at telling us if there is an urban area or not, and the optical images are good at telling us what type of area are we then looking at. Um, so if we zoom in on a village here, you can see the, the uh, result from a radar satellite. And all the uh, yellow speckles you can see here are walls or something anchored towards the satellite that gives a strong signal. And this roughly corresponds to man-made structures. Um, but you also get a lot of noise in the wooded areas. If we look at uh, how permanent the signal is over time, um, this is what you can see here. This is over a two weeks period. Um, we can find things that have a strong signal and remain the same over time. And that uh, allows us to classify things that might be urban um, or settled. So if we look at an optical satellite, it would look like this. And we can use this to tell something about the health of the vegetation. So vegetation in urban areas tells us a lot about um, wealth uh, and other socioeconomic indicators. Uh, we can also look at the local variance. So how similar is one pixel to its neighboring pixels? So in informal settlements, the variance would be very low, but in the suburban areas, it would be very high. This allows us to segment further. And we can use this to create maps like this, where we can, we can map where people live and where people don't live, and find areas that are similar to other areas. And we can then use machine learning to classify these uh, areas in what is urban, what is uh, rural, what is hinterlands, and so on. Um, but this is all a bit difficult to work with. Um, so for this project, we, we look uh, into how can we make this more accessible. And since most um, FSTs already know Excel, we decided to try and see if we can make, um, make this available in, um, in Excel. So let me just see if I can share my screen. So hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Um, so we made um, all the analysis I showed you before, which was just a brief introduction to the overall work. Um, <clears throat> we made that available in Excel um, through this add-in here. It's just a regular Excel add-in called this ATF, where you can do, so imagine I put agents here because um, this could be your bank agents, it could also be bank branches or mobile money agents, and so on. So you don't always have the latitude and longitude. Maybe you have the one three words instead. Then you can use the SATF functions to uh, convert between them. So when you mentioned what three words, they would look like they would look like this. So this coordinate would be reporter, chariots, glorious instead. And bus codes would look like um, so not as easily easily readable, but you can see uh, you can more easily see if the coordinates are close to each other or not. Um, Anyway, so you might have gathered this information in the field and you want to know things like what kind of, uh, what administrative uh, place is this coordinate in? So this would be great. Uh, if we zoom in a bit, we would get the uh, municipality itself. But then the classification I showed you before and all the satellite data, we can boil 
some of that down to a single function where you can say SATF and we want to know the simple urban status of this address or the place where this agent lives. And this will tell you this is in an urban area or it's in a rural area or it's a hinterland. Hinterland um, is places where no one really lives. Um, since it's FSPs, it might, not, it might also be relevant to figure out what's the nearest bank to this place. Um, you could also figure out the distance to the bank. Um, and to make it easier to recognize this area, you can also find the nearest place name. So this is close to the airport, which might make it more easy for, for the people looking at this data. But we can combine this with other data sources and more knowledge derived from satellites. So we can do estimates on population density. We can figure out, um, we can look at it in different ways. We can look at people per hectare at the, at the given point, but we can also try to figure out uh, how many people live within 20 meters walking distance of this bus code. Um, but this is still all in Excel and a bit, uh, it might be difficult to visualize whether or not this is a, all of this is correct or not. So you could take this and then just show it on a map uh, inside Excel. So these are the points you had here before. You can zoom in and look at them and click someone inside Opera and you will get the information you have in the spreadsheet. Uh, we'll show it here, the amount of people, the type of area, and so on. And let's say you want to add some more points. You could just add some more points here and do the calculations on them instead if you want to. Um, so instead of going out and gathering the coordinates in the field, you could just click them on a map here. Um, you can also look at some of the data that is the source of these classifications. So you can go in here and look at the actual classification if you want to. You can also see the amount of night lights at night, the areas uh, where people live and the distance to the nearest bank. So you might find a village like this, which is, or city, which is completely dark, meaning there's more than 10 kilometers to the nearest bank. Um, look at road density. Uh, which also tells us something about the urban structure. These are, these are radar images, and the texture of the optical images. But to make this a bit more actionable, you could also um, just make a quick analysis of the data you, we've calculated so far. You could go in Excel and do a quick um, below table. So let's take the area type and the amount of people at this one again. And we'll summarize it by total. So if these were your agents, you would have, and we say that an agent might be able to uh, find potential clients within 20 meters walking distance uh, in any given direction. Then 74% uh, of um, 74% of your potential clients would be in urban areas, and 90% would be in rural areas. Uh, very little in hinterlands, but then only 5% in suburban areas, which might be a bit typical to your area. So that was my, uh, my brief introduction to, to this tool, and um, I will stop sharing my screen and give, um, give the word to Abit. Good morning, this is Abed Nego. I'm um, the CEO of DSS Ghana. 
And um, what we do is uh, we are fintech. We have a software, a mobile application to help with deposit mobilization. We work with several SUSU enterprises in Ghana. These are small financial institutions that focus on serving those who are unbanked, those who would normally not go to the bank and are in the informal sector. So what we do is we provide them with software mobile applications that they can use to digitize their operations in serving these people. And we focus on making them more efficient, try to reduce their expenses, meanwhile, increasing their profitability. And we also work with a few village savings. And um, on the SUSU front, we have about 59 mobile agents from about different 28 SUSU enterprises or SUSU collectors institutions. What we have been able to do up to now is to digitize the operations and help them keep very good records of what they do. But with the introduction of the tool Caspar talked about, the Satter tool, we now have an additional feature where we can see where these customers are. So we started with what Marvin described using the what three words, we started picking up the location of the customers, and then we use the coordinates to do analysis of where they are, the population density, the buffer comparing to a couple of distances using the SATEP tool. But we have upgraded our system to integrate the map now into our system. So, we now have the map itself in our system. And as you can see, as our agents go around and serve customers, the system auto automatically will pick up their coordinates and show us where the transactions were made. So that should I serve the same customer in the same place 10 times, I'll be able to know where the customer actually stays. And I can see this is where I would always find the customer. So we have this map of where our customers are and where the agents serve them. This is something we didn't have previously, and there are a few benefits that this is bringing to us. Now, as a FinTech, we are selling a solution to help people serve a certain category of customers who are unbanked. And they are normally found within the peri-urban and the rural areas. Now, if we make our software efficient and meaningful to the users, then they will have reasons to continue using our software. And it will make them more efficient. So right now, they can see where their customers are and they are able to manage, or we are helping them manage the uh, they are agents. So let me give you an example. We are within an enterprise. Maybe they have four agents who work in an area. Then you re we realize from our system that these four agents actually work in each other space. So you have a customer in location one, and just about hundred, just about thirty meters from that customer you have another customer, and two agents are serving these two customers. One is serving the first one, the other is serving the other one, just about 20 or 30 meters away from each other. And that is not a very good use of resource. If you know where your customers are, you can actually allocate your agents to serve all the customers within an area and put another agent to serve another area. And that is something we are working on with them to make their agent deployment much more efficient than it is now. So you don't have agents coming to work in another agent space, whereas the first agent would have done the job better. Now, another thing we're also seeing is where the customers 
are populated and where some are not very populated. We are advising them in reaching out to more customers to focus in between where their customers are. So if you have a customer here and you have a set of customers there, there is space in between. And if you want to grow your customer base, that is where you want to best focus because that is your route from one customer base to another customer base. Now, how do we know that within that space, how many people are there and how many customers they can reach? Then we use the population density and the buffer population density of the SATF2 to, to calculate the number of people within the space where they are not reaching. And we can tell them something like, look, there are 5,000 people within this space you are not reaching. And it is just on the route from where you are serving a set of customers to another set of customers. So if you can focus your energy within that space and get maybe a certain percentage of the 5,000, you would be improving your customer base. And that is proving to be much more you know, targeted, be much more specific. So you don't tell people to try and increase their customer base. We are telling them there are this number of people here and they are very close to your customers and you can begin to reach them. In addition to that, where they already have customers, you're able to tell them the actual number of people within the space they are already working and can compare the number of people to the customers they have. So if there are 20,000 people in an operational area and you have customers of 2,000, then you have only 10% of the potential 20. There is a reason why you should do more to create awareness and get more customers. And that is how the tool is helping us to be more specific at helping the financial institutions to reach out to these um, customers we are working with. Another thing you can see is that on the map, we can see what is likely to be the occupation of our customers. Here is a peri-urban area of an enterprise. Now, this is a rural area of another enterprise. So whereas these people are engaged in farming and fishing, the first people are mostly into trading and doing other services. So we now understand what the occupation of our customers are likely to be. Now these people are saving because of work they are doing and their work is their occupation. So if you understand what the occupation is and how it affects how they see, then you will be able to serve them better. So the next thing we are working on which um, I think would make this tool very dear to our customers is how we can promote trade between people in the peri urban areas who are involved in services and trading with people in the farming communities who are farming produce and also want to sell their produce. Just by understanding the occupation, knowing where they are, this tool can help us begin to you know, set out trading lines that can promote trade between peri urban areas and rural areas. We are not clear on how to do that, but we know that once we begin to do that, the usage of our products and services will become more consistent because if this is the work a farmer does and it is connected to his money, he will always be using that. And that is going to improve usage of our products. So in a nutshell, the, the, the coming of the product is going to help us, or it's helping us, one, reduce the cost of 
deploying so many agents, getting in the way of other agents. We are making them much more efficient, and that is reducing cost to our enterprises. We are also able to focus our marketing and customer awareness creation, as well as sign up of new customers, because we know where our existing customers are, we know where the lapses are, and we know the people, the number of people within the places we want to create the awareness, and we can compare how many people we actually have to how many people we can have. And that is making marketing and sign up much more specific. And then the third reason is the possible um, trade that can be initiated between customers who are in different occupational areas. Farming communities and trading communities can be linked once we know what they are doing and we can see what is happening to promote trade. And this is going to be very wonderful going into the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Abed. Thank you, John. Yes. the panelists, so much for the good time. Um, I'd like to call in um, Binya now to give us the, uh, um, the key lines and conclusion before the Q&A session. Okay, thank you, John. John, thank you, Abed. Uh, I hope you all find this as, uh, as interesting as that. So, uh, such as being a learning project, we have tried to uh, document, collect and document our learnings, especially from this particular uh, project. And one thing that we have seen is that physical distance to cash in and cash out of points matters. And perceptions of what physical presence means for an SSP and the customer does differ. When the customer has to uh, use resources in terms of time, in terms of money, and opportunity cost to access financial service point, it does differ from what the bank is thinking or what MFI is thinking the cost is. So we need to look at this from the customer perspective too. Two, there are public uh, tools for defining and visualizing areas that are readily available that, that can help or SSPs to identify and illustrate proximity. Three, proximity mapping and analysis is helping to build the evidence base for reaching target customers. And lastly, we find that SSPs need to build skills in the areas of geolocation, uh, of actual and potential access points, record this, uh, maintain customer location so that they can create catchment areas, one for agent outlets, which are informed by customer data, not just supplier data. In conclusion, I would like to uh, link the two that we have talked about. These are the, uh, the, free, the free tool, the WhatsApp, the platform finder, and what customer, uh, customer presented, the machine learning. And we have seen that if we integrate these two, we will be able to deliver a practical approaches that uh, FSP, FSP can actually apply. The question, of course, is one is very specialist, uh, just special mapping, which is the most accurate approach to identifying and illustrating the nature of the proximity challenge. But of course, then there would need to be an investment in the resources, including skills, including money. So what happened in the absence of these resources? and capacity within the SSPs, we also do have the uh, alternative approach of uh, the locally available apps, which can uh, support SSPs with planning. These would also help locate settlements in specific areas and identify whether and how they are served so they can be ranked according to access and or exclusion. So what, what are we aiming at? How do we drive this further? This was a small scoping study carried out in the three partner countries. Is this relevant to other players in the sector? We think it is. How do we drive this forward? And that is of interest to us, and we would uh, very much like you to reach out to us. And you can visit us at uh, the addresses uh, on the screen now. You can also access our proximity uh, scoping report. 
can sign up to our newsletter and follow us on uh, Twitter and read our blog. Over to you, John. Uh, thank you so much, Binya. And to uh, now to our dear participants, um, we'd like to hear from you on what you need to tell us based on what has been presented by the different panelists. Please use the chat um, uh, box on the bottom right hand side of your computer or the device you're using to send us um, um, any question or comment. And we will, you know, give you or res respond to the questions as they come. Um, excuse me, I'd like to jump in for a second. I know there's only uh, five minutes left to the end of the session, but we'd be happy to extend it just for five, ten more minutes to get answers to some questions that we have for the presenters. So if you don't mind, uh, um, I'd like to extend it, maybe five or ten more minutes. Yeah, sure. Now, as we wait for the questions to come in, um, <clears throat> I'd like from the um, presentations, I've, I'm, I'm also interested, you know, in asking, um, I mean, some questions. Uh, Kaspar, you did a very good presentation on the, um, um, on the Excel, you know, worksheet, where you populate, you know, um, information, you're able to see the distance, you're able to know the nearest, maybe bank agent, the nearest service point. Now, when you're going through that, it looks to be very simple and easy, you know, to do. But my question is, what does it take to have all that information you need for you to be able, you know, to come up with that Excel sheet that you took us through? Okay, um, so it does take a lot. So some of it, so from, um, sorry, so from my perspective, what I need, what data sources that I've been here is, is this mix of satellite data. So I'd often be the Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2, and then nightlight satellites. Um, also trying to incorporate pollution data into it as well. Uh, but that is mostly for the classification and segmentation of urban areas. So in the Excel uh, sheet, this was the field called area type. That type of data is also very important for uh, estimating population density and other social economic influence. But some of the other data layers, like uh, the nearest banks, the administration, and so on and so on, that data is derived from the open street map data, uh, which is similar to Google Maps, but you can add data yourself and it is open source. Um, and that has been put into a spatial database, which I'm then querying and displaying in Excel. Um, so that is what I need. If you were the uh, user of the Excel sheet, you wouldn't need access to any of this data because it's all being run through the database, um, which takes care of, of all of the analysis for you. Um, so you wouldn't need access to any of that data, but I need access to quite a, quite a few data sources in order to make the analysis make sense. Um, did that answer your question, John? Hi, John. We cannot hear you. No, that's from Casper. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Great. I was asking that do we have open data sources for this kind of information where people can, you know, have access to, you know, to this kind of information? 
Uh, okay, I think I tried to answer that before. I don't know if I cut out or not. Um, but the, 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 all the data is open. There is there's no proprietary data used. And you can access the data through either the European Space Agency's Science Hub. Uh, I can post a link afterwards. Uh, and OpenStreetMap data and the uh, NASA data portal as well. Uh, the easiest one to use is probably the OpenStreetMap data, which has information on the road networks, um, location of banks, uh, and so on. Um, yeah, uh, someone posted a, a link in the comments on some data as well. Um, but there's tons of open geospatial data available online, um, which is then being, which is in the database at NIRIS, which I'm then making the analysis on, and I've trained the machine learning algorithm to do the, the classification of the different types of, uh, of settled areas and uh, looking into these other socioeconomic indicators as well. Uh, so it is all available online. Uh, if you hear me, you've sent in a question. Um, it is not very clear. It's about the tools and techniques that have been presented. Please may I know specifically what the question here is, and then I'll pass it on to the right panelists to give a response, if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, Linya, I still wait for questions to come in. You, um, I mean, you've talked about you know, the process of mapping and geolocating ISMs and banks and, you know, agent footprints, uh, you know, using tools like Google Earth, what rewards, you know, this has been still explained by Marvin in the work that has been done, um, I mean, in Zambia. I mean, how achievable is this in terms of costs? John, if... if to any FSP. If if we look at uh, the use of uh, these apps, what you were classic finders and others which are available, these are free to use. Actually, the only effort needed is on the routine uh, work that a field agent will do. They would only need to have downloaded this app and capture the location when they visit the group. There is no additional resource that is required. Then when they go back into the office, they can share this information in offline or online mode, and they can capture this information and um, document it the way the SSP decides to do it, either by savings group, by the location, which will give you the geo coordinate, uh, as well as the alpha numerical code for the task code finder or the what three words. So that is data which is, you can capture it, you can share it, you can also store it. So there are no additional resources required for that. In addition, I could also add that we are not using this only in the rural area. We are also using it in uh, urban and uh, peri-urban areas, what we call informal infield that you find in an urban area. Essentially, these are self-organized, self-organized groups, uh, locations, sorry, where there are savings groups. And this is a, a much ignored um, segment of the population that we are trying to serve. Why do I say this? They may be very close to a formal financial outlet, for example, a bank. In Ghana, we found this, and also in Zambia, where you find the informal saver is actually at the doorstep of our mainstream bank, but they did not use it. And the reason for this is what we call the social ex exclusion factor. They do not feel that this bank is for them. They do not feel that this bank was set up to serve people like them. What we're doing is also mapping this, uh, this segment and now deploying our field agents to also go and serve those agents. A case in point very applicable is in uh, Ghana with uh, DSS, where now the collector goes to the customer where they are, saving them the, the stress of working into the bank or walking into the MSI, they collect the money from where they are. How do you know where these people are? 
by this using these tools to to locate where they are, then you can uh, deploy your field agents to visit them. Thank you. Over to you, John. Linya, I have another question for you coming from one of the participants. The question is, can we have a very efficient, you know, tool that can help to link the people from remote areas and unbanked to microfinance arena? Please repeat that, John. Can we have very efficient tools that can help to link the people from remote areas and unbanked, you know, people to the microfinance arena? Essentially, what, what we're saying is that once you're able to capture this data, then the bank end can now refine our product and our delivery channel. We can uh, refine our models. How do we deploy our footprint? How do we deploy our agents? How can we actually effectively solve them? So we're saying that these tools will give you uh, evidence evidence that you can use now to go to work backwards to refine your product and your delivery channel. So yes. John, over to you. Thank you, Pina. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, I'm sure Kaspar, you know, could could uh, respond to this. What was not clear in the tool is whether um, what was not clear was that the tool would be giving us where we would focus by having more or less agents through machine learning or whether this has to be done manually. Kaspar, would you respond? To yes. Um, so, so far the focus has been on providing the data and leaving the decision to the decision makers. Uh, it does not provide um, proposals on how to optimize your agent network. It is something that is that, that could be added and it's, since the data is there, I don't think it would be too complex to add something similar um, if you you have technical staff they could go into the uh, API so not the Excel sheet but the underlying API the application programming interface and they could develop something similar themselves or it could be possible that we could in collaboration with FSPs try to come up with some recommendations uh, optimizing networks as well, but it's not uh, it's not in the tool now, and it's not in the it's not in the current scope. Thank you, thank you, Kaspar. I think I'll take another one more question. Um, you know, before we wrap up, since we are running out of time, and I would like um, Abednego to respond to this. Having worked, you know, with this solution and being able to track the agents and, you know, the customers, knowing how much an agent has collected, knowing how much a customer needs to withdraw, you know, from an agent at any point in time, how can this solution or how have this solution contributed to liquidity management for the agents that you work with? Thank you very much, John. We, 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 we are able to get information from agents quickly, so deploying monies to and from them then becomes quickly done as well. We know where the agents are when they request for um, liquidity floats, and so going to them is easier than it used to be because now we can see them and we're actually seeing how their float is going down. Before they can even raise the alarm, we know what can happen. So we are kind of prompted to act ahead of time. 
and that saves us to manage uh, liquidity. We don't wait for things to run out to zero. We see things coming down, and then we quickly move in that direction to solve the problem. Thank you, um, Abed Nego. Yeah, thank you very much, Abed. Um, I think at this time I will call in uh, Gaia. I think um, it's time to do the wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for uh, staying involved for your questions and comments. As a next step, I'd like to invite you to um, join two upcoming webinars hosted by CGAP. One of them is today, later on in the day, and the other one is on December 18th talking about a similar topic, agent networks at the last mile. One of them will focus on policymakers and regulators, and the other one on the role of FSPs. And finally, uh, I'd like to let you know that the presentation that you saw today and uh, the recording of this webinar will be shared with everyone who had registered. And uh, we also invite you to stay connected and continue the discussion. And my colleague in the chat box will share the webinar links as well as our LinkedIn group uh, links so that you can